at nine. He is one of the most outspoken critics of police use of force here in the Valley. But he gets some on-the-job training about use of force it's tonight. Very interesting stuff. Reverend Jarrett Maupin led protests and marches after Phoenix police shot and killed an unarmed man. Well, tonight, he gets a chance to experience the split-second decisions that police have to make when encountering a suspect. And our Troy Hayden was right along with him tonight getting the training as well. This must have been eye-opening. It was. It was a really interesting experience. You know, we've all watched those protests all over the country after police officers are accused of shooting people who aren't armed. But what would happen if one of those protesters felt what it was like to wear a badge and then be put in a life-or-death situation himself? So I'm going to have you put, your hol put the holster on right inside your, your belt loop there. Jarrett Maupin gets his weapon. You might recognize him as a high-profile organizer in the minority community. Just last month, he led marches on Phoenix Police Headquarters after an officer shot an unarmed man. We want his badge. We want his gun. We want his job. Today, he accepted an invitation to look at things from the other side, agreeing to go through a force-on-force -force training session with the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. Three scenarios where you have to decide to shoot or not shoot. Scenario one is a call about a man casing cars in a parking lot. Moppin approaches the man and starts asking questions. What? Where you have your hand in your gun? You're looking for your vehicle. What kind of car do you drive? Where you have your hand in your gun? What kind of car do you drive? This is my car, man. Oh. Moppin, the officer, is shot. It happens that fast. At what time did you think that it was time for you to address the use of force that was given? Uh, when he came to the back of the vehicle. Okay. Uh, and and was hiding. You know, I could sense something something was wrong. Scenario two: a call of two men fighting. What's going on today, gentlemen? What's wrong with you? What's going on today, gentlemen? What do you want? What's happening here? What's wrong with Back you? Back up, huh? What are you doing, man? Hey! Hey! He shouldn't approach me. He shouldn't approach me. He shouldn't approach me. He shouldn't approach me. in there? Yeah. What are you doing? You just shot him. Uh, hey, he rushed me. Tell me why you shot. Well, I, I shot because he was within that zone. You know, I felt there was a, an imminent threat. I, I didn't necessarily see him armed, um, but he, he came clearly to do some harm to, uh, to the officer, to my person. It's hard to make that call. It's a, it shakes you up. Again, an unarmed man was shot. Scenario three, a call about a possible burglar walking down the street. Moppin gets him on the ground. He's not complying. I need you to keep your hands up, sir. For what? Because I need to check that waistband. Well, what? What are you doing? Because I don't know hey, what you have under there. Everybody, look at this guy. What are you doing? No shots fired. Huh? But the suspect did have a hidden knife in his waistband. I went through the scenarios, too, without seeing what Moppin did. So, uh, do you have keys, or uh, do you have anything you show me that? Yeah, don't worry about no, it. No, I need to talk to you. Come on, come on out over here. Well, I'm dead. Maricopa County Sheriffs, get on the ground. Get on the ground. Both of you, get on the ground. Get on the ground. For what? Get back. Get back. Same results for both of us. Things happen very fast out here. I asked Maupin what his biggest takeaway from this exercise will be. I didn't understand how important uh, compliance was, but but after going through this, yeah, my attitude has, has changed. Uh, it, this is all unfolding in, in 10 to 15 seconds. Um, people need to comply with the, with the uh, orders of law enforcement officers for their own sake. Thanks to the Maricopa wow. County Sheriff's Office for uh, taking us through that today. That, it was an eye-opener. That's a tremendous uh, admission that, that Reverend Maupin just made. Right. That you need to comply for your own safety. Right, and he saw it. I mean, he plainly shot a man who was not armed but was coming at him, and yeah. he felt, you know, that he was unsafe at that point. He was coming after him, and, and he fired. Yeah, and I don't think any officer goes into work thinking, I'm going to shoot and kill somebody today. But no. these interesting, you know, things happen, like the guy coming from behind the SUV Boom, and you're done. And you, you are. How, Six how, shots did you, how did you feel about about those scenarios when you were going through them? How did, did it change your perspective? Yeah, it just it, I, I've been through one of these before about four or five years ago, but it just reinforced how fast things happen. And you think at the time, oh, I can think through this, and I can figure this all out. No, time. it's boom. It's just there. Yeah. It's that fast. I have a lot of respect for Maupin for going through that. Yeah, I agree. I do too. And agreeing to go through that and, and seeing it from the other side as right. well. Do you think it changes the way he approaches these issues going forward. He says he's going to go out into the community and say what he said at the very end there. You have to comply with what police officers tell you. Let everything sort out at the end, but just do what they tell you right then and sort things out afterward. Right. Interesting. Interesting. All right, yeah. thanks, Troy. Good, stuff, good stuff, Troy. Stuff.
I'm curious, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you see this picture? Good. That's, that's a hero. Uh, brutality. Security. Authority. A crime fighter. Scared death. Get to help people. Protection. Like I'm going to be in trouble. So what's the first thing that comes to mind when you see this picture? Americans have very different feelings when it comes to law enforcement. And those very different feelings are wrapped up in our demographics. Somewhat unsafe, I guess. <laughs> Security. Safety. How do you feel? Cato Institute reports that 68% of Caucasians feel favorably toward police, while only 40% of African Americans do. Other deciding factors are how old you are and how much money you make. Uh, I'm a little worried. What did I do wrong? Safety. Yeah, trust. Why the difference in opinion? Well, that has a lot to do with those groups' different experiences with the police. One statistic that stands out is that black men aged 15 to 34 are between 10 and 16 times more likely to be killed by police than other people. Why are so many young black men disproportionately killed by law enforcement in the United States? The fear of black men that goes deep into the fear of the slaves. And it's understandable why you'd be fear, fearful of slaves. The very nature of, of slavery uh, tends to provoke rebelliousness. So I think it's deep in the memory banks of the, of the country. Although opinions on police are split, we know there's no entire demographic that's anti-law enforcement since 9 in 10 Americans oppose a decrease in police officers in their community. An overwhelming majority believe that we should take measures to reform our police system, including 89% of people who believe police should be equipped with body cameras, and 79% who think there should be independent investigations of police misconduct. Adding to the already complicated debate is a lack of consistency in state and local police practices across the country. In the United States, our police departments are not all uniform. In fact, there are about 18,000 different police agencies in our country with our own policies, procedures, and training. And I think it's, it's vital that we recognize that we have a million cops in this country. They're not all going to conform to a model of how we think every police officer should be. Which leads us to our main question. If we were to make America from scratch today, should our federal government increase regulations on our country's police departments? It has happened again. Just nine days after the uproar in Ferguson, a grand jury in New York City has refused to indict yet another white police officer. The Minnesota police officer who shot and killed Philando Castile just last year during a traffic stop has been found not guilty of manslaughter. They determined that no probable cause exists to file any charge against Officer Wilson and returned a no true bill on each of the five indictments. My son loved this city and this city killed my son and the murderer gets away. On the other hand, the majority of Americans see increased criticism of the police as an attack on public servants. 61% of Americans say there is a war on police. And as the country is hotly debated policing in the U.S., the issue has turned political. These are tough times to be a cop. Outside Atlanta Friday, officers from around the country mourned one of their own. Well, the war on police continues to rage on. Five police officers have been killed in the line of duty just this week alone. So we reached out to the St. Paul Police Department for an interview, and they turned us down. Um, a lot of police have been distrusting of the media, and so... Uh, they turned down our repeated requests for interviews. If you had to use one word right now to describe the relationship between the public and the police force? I would say skeptical. I'd say strained. Strained. Misunderstood. So we finally got an interview with law enforcement, and here we are at the Invergrove Police Department, and we're going to interview Police Chief Paul Schnell. Do you believe that there is a war on police right now? I think many people in the profession would say that that's the case. Um, I don't believe that that's the case. I don't think that there's a war on police. I, I hate that feeling when I know people are like super, super afraid of me. Okay, I know a lot of people say, you know, what the problems are and what the issues are with the policing system, but my question is how do we solve them? Body cams are absolutely essential, I think, to the reform effort. 
independent investigation and fact-finding and independent oversight of policing also essential. Today's national standard for police use of force was set by the Supreme Court case Graham v. Connor in 1989 when the court ruled that the police use of force must be objectively reasonable and that it is to be determined by the point of view of a reasonable officer on the scene. Any further regulations on when police can use lethal force must be left to the states. However, a 2015 report by Amnesty International found that every U.S. state plus Washington, D.C. fails to comply with the United Nations basic principles on the use of force and firearms. Yep, so here we are just uh, three years out from the publication of our deadly force report in 2015, and unfortunately no state has yet risen to the level of international standards on how they choose to assess lethal force by police. So it's important that for a state's use of force law, in order to even be considered near the threshold of that, or we hope going in that direction, the laws hold officers to an accountability standard in which they are restricted to use force or to believe that they should be able to kill someone unless it's absolutely necessary and that they're responding to whatever incident in a way that's proportional. Let's set national standards for policing. 18,000 police departments, one constitution. Every single officer in this country is bound by that constitution. So we need reasonable, job-related, non-discriminatory standards that would bind every officer to the same practices when it comes to stop and frisk, laws of arrest, rules of evidence, and Lord knows, use of force, and particularly lethal force. Some lawmakers in California have already started thinking about how to address the issue. This year, they introduced a bill known as the Police Accountability and Community Protection Act, which changes language about reasonable force to necessary force. The bill unfortunately doesn't meet international standards, but we think it's an incredibly genuine first step to move towards that. The lawmakers who support the legislation hope it would remove undue legal cover for police officers involved in fatal shootings, while allowing for the use of lethal force when necessary. Our primary hope is that it would change the way that officers understand their role and that they ought to be more restrictive as to when they use force. It shouldn't be as permissive. And that the use of lethal force standards that are outlined in international law are not only about protecting those individuals, but the officers themselves. And so I think it's perfectly reasonable for one to assume that no one should attempt to take a life in, in, unless the purpose is to save one. Those types, those repeated incidents actually make it less safe for us to, to do our job. The thing for me is how do we make, how do we create and build connections mm. in the places where we have the least amount of trust? I wish, I would want people to believe that the worst that's going to happen is maybe you get a ticket. Mm -hmm. Maybe. So Norm, you were a police officer for 34 years and you're the former police chief of Seattle. I'm curious, um, at what point in your career did it lead you to believe that our policing system needs to be reformed? Well, you're going to take me down memory lane here, and it's a painful memory. Fourteen months into the job, I walked into the county courthouse in San Diego where I was originally a police officer. And I went up to the prosecutor and I said, you probably want to dismiss this case. And he said, well, why would I do that, Officer Stamper? And I said, well, I arrested him for being drunk in a public place, unable to care for yourself or the safety of others, except that he wasn't drunk. So this prosecutor did not take kindly to my explanation that this guy used profanity and called me a pig, of all things. And I arrested him. And the biggest favor of all was a prosecutor who asked me if the Constitution of the United States meant anything to me. But Lord knows how much additional damage I would have done had that prosecutor not done what he did. And from that point on, I really did believe Early in my police career, the police in America belonged to the people, not the other way around. The more the police are part of the community itself, hopefully I envision a time where as humans, we, we can live in a society where we can have much more solidarity. What, what do you want people to feel when they see police officers? I want people to feel like maybe I was going too fast, maybe I was... Um, but that, that they're a community resource. So what do you think? Do you think we should have stricter regulations on lethal force? Do you think there's a war on police? 
What would you change about the way our law enforcement operates in our country? In the city of Garfield, Police Lieutenant Michael Marsh just picked up the department's newest asset, a freshly painted MRAP. It stands for Mine Resistant Armor Protected Vehicle, the kind of heavily armored truck used in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is not a military vehicle anymore. It's a police department fleet vehicle, and you can see by the name it's an emergency rescue vehicle, and that's just how we're treating it. Police departments across the state, particularly in the suburbs and shore area, have acquired more than $40 million worth of surplus military equipment, including 13 MRAPs, through a federal program called 1033. Data obtained by NJ Advanced Media shows local departments acquired 2,400 pieces of leftover military equipment, including 196 Humvees, more than 600 night sights, and 100 pairs of night vision goggles. By NJTV's count, 106 municipal police departments and nearly a dozen county and state agencies also acquired surplus equipment. Aside from shipping and maintenance costs, which ran about $23,000 for this vehicle, the Garfield Police Department, like the rest around the state, got this surplus equipment for free. This vehicle is used to supplement our department's unit. It can be used in floodwaters. It can be used if there was some type of an attack, terrorist attack, or a barricaded subject. Garfield PD was one of several departments that responded to the Garden State Plaza active shooter three years ago and to swatting incidents that took place all over the East Coast last year. They plan to outfit the 10-foot high, 14-ton truck with lights, sirens, and police scanners. But the program isn't without controversy. It came to a head after the 2014 protests in Ferguson, Missouri, following the death of Michael Brown. Police responded to the streets with military great riot gear. Senator Nia Gill ushered legislation in New Jersey to bring more transparency to the program. She's asking the Attorney General to review it to ensure it's being followed properly. The municipality, the governing body, must uh, approve uh, the acquisition of any uh, militarized gear. And uh, they must do it by resolution so that the community has an opportunity to voice their position and their opinion on how, one, their money will be spent, and probably more importantly, uh, if they want to have a police department that becomes more militarized. But police departments reject that notion, saying the needs for use have increased in recent years, especially after similar military vehicles were used in response to the San Bernardino attacks and Pulse nightclub shooter in Orlando. We're not looking to go out and use this for anything other than specialized operations that would require it. In Garfield, Brianna Venosi, NJT.